Welcome on into Drinks with Binks. I'm, of course, Julie Stewart Binks, and we are drinking and binking on this Thursday. I know you're seeing this on a Friday, but full disclaimer, this is not live. Um, and that's probably a good reason. We have on the couch here today Rangers legend, former NHL Ron Duguay, who is going to be helping us uh, break down some awesome things going on in the NHL and beyond. And as we like to do, we like to drink on this show. We do. And uh, what are what do you what did you want to drink today? I'm a beer drinker, being a Canadian, and uh, it's hard to find kind of what I'm looking for in Canada, like Molson Canadian. Mm -hmm. To track down Molson Canadian, I have to really go after it. So I tend to go for a lighter beer, like Mick Ultra, Coors Light, right. that sort of thing. And but if it a beer is a beer and it looks light, and I will have some of this. Yeah, that's that, that's my reasoning as well. I'll drink anything if you put it in front of me, as evidenced by a, a TV show with me drinking and it is actually canadian beer uh molson triple x so be great if we got a sponsorship from them too because we are drinking them on the show and let's uh let's go the, bottoms up yeah so by the way this is my first like first. i've always wanted first beer to do a happy hour before going on a show like yeah. when i work for msg and they thought, no, that's not a good idea. Yeah, it's so, probably not a good idea. Yeah. But you know what? We can do whatever we want here on the show because cheers. why not? To yes, my fellow cheers, Canadian. fellow Canadians. Mmm, sweet, sweet nectar. Oh, oh wow! wow this... And uh, where do you want to? We can we can drink these beers anywhere in the world. We might be in a studio right now, but we could go literally anywhere. Where would you want to go? Whoa. Um... Well, I, I think of places I've been to, and the one place that I remember that was so different, and that was Bora Bora. Okay. Bora Bora was, um, had the, the, the beauty of the world, mm -hmm. being in the water. I love water. I, I stay close to the water. I feel better about close to the water, sand, all of that. Um, it, that might sound boring, but that, it's beautiful. That sounds, that sounds beautiful. And we're going to channel that and take us to a beautiful beach in Canada, Cortez Island, which I just learned about. <laughs> this morning okay. here we are right now where uh, this is kind of near vancouver vancouver island in a way there's i looked it up there's like many different islands so you know the more you know i guess mm -hmm. so it's not bora bora but she's but still a beaut i love going to vancouver especially mm -hmm. uh in july <laughs> yeah it's one of it's our great. favorite, because in playing the NHL, you have all your cities, and people ask me, what's your favorite city? And I would say, well, of course I love to go to Montreal and New York. I was part of uh, New York. But Vancouver, the mountains and the beauty of it, it kind of made you forget about you're in a hockey game that right. night. Right. What about the Roxy? Did you ever go there? I, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> this is a legendary bar club in Vancouver. Does a lot of damage to hockey players and hockey broadcasters. I've spent some time there as well. It, it's funny. With certain cities, uh, the coach would uh, try to charter planes out after the game. And that was one of them. We didn't get to spend much time there. Montreal couldn't spend any time no. there. Toronto was okay. Dangerous. Edmonton, we can be there all day long. And that yeah. <laughs> They'd like plan for you to be there a week just because yeah. they know you can't get into Winnipeg, too much Winnipeg, yes. Minnesota was the same thing. But for us um, as a team, uh, we just would find fun no matter where mm -hmm. we were, you know, just being the guys together. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing as far as the difference of today's players, today's teams, because they charter everything yeah. everywhere. So they don't really get that opportunity to bond. And that bonding is so important with how you play on the ice. And so I have story after story with things that we've done on the road. That what's like? What's one of your favorite stories from the road? Hmm. You can say, <laughs> hey, we're drinking on the show. You know, we can do what we want. It's it's always, uh, we always, there's certain guys on the team. My favorite team, teammate was Nick Fotillo, a prankster. He was always up to something. Like he would love to check into a hotel early and get in the room before his roommate would get there and be hiding somewhere, hiding in the closet and that sort of thing. And that night, and if a guy had too much to drink and he'd pass out, well, what he'd like to do, he'd, he'd find a piece of fish or, or, or crab or whatever it might be and go stick it on the guy's chin or on his chest and have him wake up to that sort of thing. So I'm talking prankster stuff i'm not talking pranks other are thing. great yeah yeah we'll leave that other stuff to the imagination but uh the pranks are what get gets guys together right what's the things you talk about the next day in fact i'm thinking about one thing right now and uh, as you know i was uh, went through the days of studio 54 mm -hmm. give me a, a glimpse of what it was like all right I'll give you a couple stories because I have many stories and uh, I'll give you the clean stories. But, it, you know, upstairs was romantic. Downstairs was different. The main floor was just a dance floor, which that's where you would find me because I love music. I like dancing. And if I can find a pretty woman to dance with, awesome, right? Um, 
and so I've met a lot of celebrities there. Mm. And this one time, I'm standing right by the dance floor, and I have this woman doing this to me. I'm like looking, and I'm like, is she pointing at me? And I'm looking, oh my God, that's Liza Minnelli. Oh, wow. So Liza Minnelli's doing this to me. So I just start walking towards her, and she goes, she says, hi, Ron. I want to introduce myself. Oh my God, Liza knows who I am. Then she calls over her husband. He comes over. We're chatting. We're talking. And then she looks looks over to my left and she says, Cher, come over here. So wow. She brings over Cher, meets Cher. Cher says, uh, do you like to dance? I'm like, yeah, I like to dance. So next thing you know, we spent probably a good hour dancing that night. You and Cher. Me and Cher. Hitting the dance floor. That's just part of the was story. That a, was that surreal for you, or did it feel yeah. normal? I grew up watching Sonny and Cher. So you, you, if you can just imagine, uh, I'm dancing with Cher. And there's actually a picture. There's not many pictures taken back there, but there's, someone took a photo of her and I dancing, and it, it ended up being in a waltz. So most songs there were the Bee Gees and really Rod Stewart and, and Billy Joel and all that stuff. Uh, but occasionally would, they'd throw a slow song towards the end of the night, mm -hmm. and sure enough, there's a picture of her and I, her on my shoulders, and I got this look on my face like, oh, my God. Right. <laughs> and uh, and so anyways, so Eliza says, why don't you guys come over to the house? We'll go have some cocktails. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> and so next thing you know, Sharon and I in a car over to Liza's and we're sitting there waiting and waiting and Liza show up. And then Sharon says, the F with this, we're leaving. Right. And so then we get in the car, we go somewhere else. And that's where the story starts, stops. Uh, or it could have started as well. It seems well, it started, like these, these stories yeah. just like very interesting. <laughs> no. um, and that's unique it, because in this day and age, probably a lot of celebrities might not necessarily recognize Rangers players or hockey players. Like you were, you guys were a bigger deal back then. You could say, oh, much bigger. Yeah, knew um, people knew who I was when I was walking around. Uh, the, you know, it was myself and uh, like Reggie Jackson was big and uh, Robin Williams. I run into Robin Williams all the time, and then I became f uh, familiar, friendly with those in the arts. Mm -hmm. Andy Warhol became a friend. He, That's incredible. Yeah. What What was Andy Warhol like? Andy was uh, he was different, but he he uh, he was a unique guy and uh, very quiet, kind of shy, and but he loved to be like my wingman was Johnny McEnroe. Or I was okay. his wingman. I, he's younger than me, so, you know, we would always hang out. And he loved hanging out with us. And he always carried this little Polaroid. And occasionally he'd watch him. John and I would always be talking, and Andy would be just taking pictures of us. And, and for us, oh, it's just Andy, right? It's just Andy. And so eventually he says, Ron, I'd like to put you on the cover of my magazine. Interview. Great. So there I am on the cover of Andy Warhol's magazine. At the time, I'm still young. I'm not quite understanding the bigness of this. Well, sure enough, I understood it. The first day it came out, Steven Spielberg is in Manhattan. He says, I got to meet this guy. They call my agent. Next thing you know, I'm having dinner with Steven Spielberg and Roy Schneider, who did the movie Jaws. And I'm like, why does he want to meet with him? Well, he's doing this movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark, oh, man. and he's trying to find a lead like me he goes yeah he's considering you so i'm having dinner with steven spielberg and i think i'm only 23 and i'm quiet and i'm shy i'm not getting what the dinner was it was essentially an interview but that's I probably know. a good thing because then you're not as nervous for it i was not nervous but i wasn't i wasn't playing to what mm. i think he wanted to see harrison ford harris yes so he gets harrison ford harrison <laughs> that ford nobody Ronda i Day. guess yeah right <laughs> And so it was funny how one thing led to another. So, so I met a lot of interesting people. And, um, but the one thing I had to be f careful with, and it happened one time. So I'm around Andy, and we're having uh, drinks. And then he leaves. And, you know, he's, he's always, there's always a couple young guys that hang out with him. And, and so the, everyone left. And um, I'm at the bar, and I'm there with a buddy. And next thing you know, my, no, my buddy notices that I'm really off. Like, I can't even walk oh. to the point where... Someone roofied me. Someone roofied me. So that happened one time. So at the time, I had a restaurant, and it was called Sticks. And with the restaurant, we decided to buy a limousine with a driver to make sure that we're always kind of taken care of. Sure enough, my buddy has to go in the front, tell the driver, go to the back of Studio 50, come pick me up, because I didn't want anybody seeing yeah. that I could not walk. Oh, gosh. that's So I, I just gave you a awful. mix of yeah, different wow. things that This that is kind just of... our first block of the show. Yeah. Well, guys. I on, on and on. Oh, we are going to get to a whole lot more. we got to take our first time out on the program, but we'll be back. Drinks with Binks. Stay tuned.
Hey guys, welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We got Ron Duguay on the couch here today. We are drinking some Molson Triple X, and it it really hits you. Just the first couple of sips, I think it's like over seven percent. So it gets me talking. Yolo. Yeah, that's what we want. That's like the whole strategy of the show. No, I'm joking. Okay. It's we're just having a good time. Uh, we were talking about your days. Now I have my Canadian coming out. I'm like, oh, we're talking about your days as a hockey player. Hey. <laughs> and and uh, have you played? Have you hit the ice? Like, do you play regularly still? Or I wouldn't what's... say I play regularly, but I still like to do exhibitions. Like recently, we had a back-to-back -back against the uh, Boston alumni team. The Rangers did. Mm -hmm. Went to Boston, oh, yeah. came back. Then we played at the Garden. And uh, I've been wanting them to do that for the longest time because I, 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 I would love to see someday that we have the original six teams have oh, a do, uh, do a league and have the players go back-to-back, -back, and then you have the fans to participate. So, yeah, I still play. I don't play as much. Um, but I enjoy. I just enjoy to be able to st step on the ice and still feel like I can play at my right. age, and touch the puck. Uh, being connected to the game, it helps me when I talk to game to be able to play it. Mm -hmm. I love being with the guys. Uh, I'll do some tours in the eastern part of Canada, in the Maritimes, uh, Newfoundland, because they love their hockey there. We'll go. We'll travel from one little city to another. We'll be four games and five nights. Again, being with the guys. The one thing about as an athlete or in the entertainment business, that's what you miss. It's not just the game, but you miss entertaining. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, you do the social things and the galas and all that. So it's it's been so much part of my life that it it uh, I feel alive when I do it, and right. it helps me stay in shape. And uh, well, so. it's good that you're able to still do it because we've had hockey players on the program before. James Wisniewski, who said he just can't get back on the ice, like his body's just broken down at this point. Um, but for you, that's great because it is just such a it's so much more than just on the ice, but off the ice too. You mentioned yep. entertainment, and I can't have you here without asking about the hockey sock rock. Hockey sock rock, yeah. Uh, this <laughs> is unique for those of you who haven't seen it. How would you describe this musical group that you had? <laughs> Phil Esposito, Dave Maloney, J.D., John Davidson, who's now the president. Uh, we were good friends with Alan Thicke. I, I've known many celebrity types who play hockey, like to play hockey, mm -hmm. Jerry Brookheimer right. being one of them, Cuba Good and Kiefer Sutherland. And Alan uh, wanted to do something as a fundraiser for diabetes. And he, he thought of, because he's in the music business, do you guys, would you consider doing a song? And, you know, for me, I'm all in for whatever, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have a drink, we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yes, and, right? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, he came up with this song, and it was uh, Hockey Sock Rock. And on the flip side were the Kings. I can't remember the name. Something about your misconduct. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, so we did it here in Manhattan at Sky Rink. I think, I don't know if it's still called oh, the yeah, Sky, yeah, Sky Rink. So Chelsea we did Chelsea. it there. Yeah. So we did it upstairs. And uh, if you've seen the video, really bad quality. But it was fun. Yeah, Dion and the Puck Tones, I'm being told. That's yeah. what the other... It's great. Like, it, when you're not watching this show, Google it. It's You don't see this kind of stuff, first of all, athletes doing it, but hockey players. Because mm. everyone's a little bit more vanilla these days. We mm. mentioned the guys being on charters. You know, everything's very regimented. Yeah. And what was it like, though, as a pro athlete back when you played? Like, how different... Was it, you know, you mentioned the celebrities, but just the overall vibe, the, it seemed like it was more fun. A lot more fun. And we were very regular. Like, we take a regular flight. We're not sitting in first class. We sit among everyone else. And we felt regular. And I think because of that, we were able to be grounded. A lot of us were Canadian. Most of us come from good families. We were grounded. So we, we were very respectful to everyone, to the fans. Grounded yet still dancing with Cher. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. To, I don't know. That's how you where stay I come off the ground. And, yeah, <laughs> and this is what I would tell the coach, Coach uh, Herb Brooks, who was my coach, right. and I said, uh, Coach, you know how some guys ride the bike afterwards, get the lactic acid out of their legs? I said, You know what? I go dance. <laughs> you know, it, like it's a cardio. Like that that one year, I was such in great shape. A lot of it had to do with, like it'd be on a Sunday night. We'd play at the Garden Sunday night, and after the game, I'd be the first one out of the gym, Studio 54. I'd be dancing, and... Uh, How would you describe your dancing style? Was it kind of like John Travolta? Freelance. In, uh, freelance. Oh. Freelance. It was whatever I felt. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like I, my I would blow out a move like this occasionally, but it was just whatever the music was. I can dance Billy Joel, Rod Stewart, the Bee Gees, anything you want. You want a waltz, I can do that too. How is it now? For me, mm -hmm. uh, I got some moves, <laughs> and my moves are, I've been, uh, my son will teach me a few things. My son's 25, my son Noah, and he's got his own thing going. I've, I've, I've actually copied some of his Yeah, well, can you give us a taste of what that might be like? Well, it's, gone, it's going down low. Oh, going to, even, going, yeah, you going can down low. that you with want, the yeah. knees, too? Yeah, going down low. Do you want to see a little bit? Um, no, we don't. We'll sure, see I mean, we'll see I'd it. love to. I don't want to. 
Down, okay. <laughs> it all starts like that, and then I make my way up. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. I mean, that does, I didn't even know what I just watched yeah. right there, but that was great. Yeah, and the, that's, women, the women like it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure they do. I'll take, their, uh, take your word for that. But um, that's a lot of fun. That's a question. Uh, just how it was oh. different back so, then, but clearly you show me um, fun, and guys don't necessarily <laughs> show that now. So back then, the single guys would be together all the time, like in the city. We'd hang out in the city. And then when we got on the road, the married guys who wanted to be with the single guys couldn't wait to go on the road because they wanted to hang with us. And we wanted to hang with them because we just had a lot of fun together. So when we'd go on the road, then it would be the whole team. And back then, it wouldn't be, there would be no separation. If we say we're going to Roxy's, everyone goes to Roxy's. Yeah. And we stuck together. And for the most part, it was all good. It was all in good taste. We didn't get in trouble. And um, Well, there was no Snapchat and Instagram to capture it, so you never know what yes. happened. You never know what happened, especially when you went back to the hotel. And, uh, and we again, we stuck together. Well, now, like, when I covered the Anaheim Ducks, there was definite, like, the leadership guys stuck together. Some of the European guys would be together. There were separations between the different groups. And then everyone's just on their phone, and everyone's on Tinder. And like this listening is listening to music, just, listening to something. Yeah, so it kind of changes the vibe. Yeah. You mentioned Herb Brooks, and I want to track back to that. Oh, you guys no. didn't necessarily get along. No, I got say. along with him. Okay, but he he had a problem with you. He had a problem with uh, how po I think part of it was how popular I was. In my f first season with him, I ended up scoring forty goals. Right? I mean, Herb, what more can I do? Mm -hmm. But occasionally he would bring me in the office. He'd sit there and. And I'm thinking, we're going to talk power play, penalty kill, and he'd have the newspaper. He'd, he'd have the New York Post opened up. And he'd have it open up at page six. <laughs> and it would be like, Ron Duguay with Farrah Fawcett last night, and Ryan O'Neill's not going to like this. And, and he goes, Dukes, listen, here's page six, and here's the sports page, and I want you back here. Uh. Not over here, I want you back here. And so that happened more than once. And uh, How'd you feel about that? I, I, what am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> Other than perform. Like, I would always perform. I'd show to practice, and I'd always just get there on time, and I'd practice hard, and then when i show up for games, I played hard. Scored 40 goals. What more do you want? So, but he found a way to uh, not like my style, and, um, but here's the thing. The, probably within a week of me retiring, I get a phone call. I'm in California, and it's Herb Brooks. He goes, Ron? I go, yeah. He says, I'm just calling you to, to let you know that I think your career, you had a wonderful career. You should be very proud of that. I'm like, Herb? He goes, yeah, it's Herb. I didn't know what to say to him. That's to like the scene from Billy Madison with Steve yeah. Buscemi. To this day, because he, you know, he passed away, and I didn't get a chance to see him again, I sh my conversation should have been a lot more grateful for the call, mm -hmm. and I didn't do it. I was just kind of in in a little bit of a shock and not yeah. sure. I didn't know what to say. I wasn't holding bitterness because I ended up going to Detroit mm -hmm. for three years, which it ended up being a good thing because I was there. I ended up, I got married, I settled down and uh, scored a lot of goals there. But um, yeah, but Herb Brooks was that one, is that con one conversation I, I regret to this day. Well, I mean, you obviously can't feel bad in that moment like that as you said that's a unique call to have based on the relationship that you had had with him and for him for him he was apologizing I think for having traded me mm. I think he felt like he made a mistake he should have he sh we should have had more of a partnership more right. let's talk uh like you look at the situation in Toronto Babcock yeah. gets fired and um, you know, coaches uh, feel like they want to be their own entity, mm -hmm. and and they kind of need to be uh, a separation between the players and the coach. But there still needs to be have a, and you still need to be likable. Right. You can be firm, be likable, and you can be respected that way. But sometimes it's either my wear or the cold shoulder and that yeah. sort of thing. And I think that's. I don't know if you're going to ask me about that, but I think in Toronto, I think that's what happened. You get some senior players, some skilled players, that they need to be relaxed when they play the game. Right, right. They need to enjoy the game. If they're going to provide leadership for everybody else, they need to come in a happy place. They need to look forward to going to practice. Definitely. And we are going to look forward to discussing more about this and Mike Babcock and the whole situation in Toronto when we return on Drinks with Banks. Don't go anywhere.
Hey guys, welcome on back. Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We got Ron Duguay on the couch here, former NHLer, Rangers legend, broadcaster, and you've already finished your Molson Triple X. Yeah, like good. a true good Canadian boy. So, um, do you want some more? I guess it'd be rude if I didn't do is it, that. Is it on ice? Uh, uh, I think it's on fake ice, but it's okay. cold. Yeah, and if you don't, I can yeah. pour it if you don't mind. Here, you go. Here we go. Yeah, you know, I know how to pour beer too, okay? I'm a hockey playing Canadian. Why do you think I have a. Okay, I wouldn't have done that strategy, but to each their own. <laughs> um, oh, look at all that head. There we go. It's it's eliminating some of the gas. Okay. Because if you're eating food at the same time, it doesn't digest your food properly. So if I was going to have a piece of meat or something, yeah. it doesn't digest properly. So, But that's a much... Uh, see, when I, I, I drink a lighter beer, and I'll have to do it again. I'm sorry. No, that was okay. a little too much. But, um, yeah, go ahead. No, I... I I'm looking forward to seeing you have to try to <laughs> drink this. That's a lot more uh, foam than I was planning on. No, I've got a lot of experience <laughs> as well. Um, but we were we were talking about Canadians, and Mike Babcock was just fired on Wednesday by the Toronto Maple Leafs, who were on a 16 winless streak. Yes. They had just really been out of touch, especially defensively. They have some of the highest paid forwards in the league, and they just couldn't get it done. And I asked you before the show, was this the right time, and what do you think? Yeah, because uh, someone knows, either the manager or the president, they know what's going on in the dressing room. Why are they losing? Are they losing because, okay, we have injuries? Are we losing because we have bad bounces? Are we losing because technically we need to be a little better or we need a different goaltender? Mm -hmm. If you can look at that, okay, fine, we stick with the coach. Right. But if you start feeling like players are not happy, they're not performing because they're not happy, and they f and if you start seeing players, skill players, playing with some tension in their hands, and they're afraid to make mistakes because coach is going to be all over them, then you got to make a decision. Do we wait until February to see if things change? Do you have a conversation with the coach to see if you can get him to change? Mm -hmm. I'm sure they have already. And uh, so now is the time to do it because you don't wait till later because every game is so important in trying to make it into the play playoffs. You see how tight it is. Within four, you can have a good season. You can be out of the playoffs by four points. Right. So, and especially at this point in the season, I think uh, I heard that the marker is almost like Thanksgiving, where if yeah. you're not in the hunt, yes. unless you're the St. Louis Blues from last year, yeah. you're not going to be able to make the playoffs. And with this roster, the amount of money you pumped in, it's unacceptable. Yeah. So then when you, you mentioned the players not liking a coach, we, uh, you know, I just saw on Twitter from James Myrtle from The Athletic, he said that 90% of the room of the players didn't want Mike Babcock. What does that mean? Like, what does that look like? When, like, what is it about a coach where an entire team almost doesn't like him? What's happening? Um, it's just the way he speaks to them. And um, a lot of it is, is technique um, because he's so, um, he, most coaches is, they, they talk about playing without the puck and, and have this awareness, don't make mistakes, positioning yourself. A lot of players are more instinctive, especially skilled players. They rely on their instincts. And so if they're tr if he's trying to make them too robotic and, and takes them to a place where they're not comfortable, that's not fun. And, and so if you have many of them are feeling that way, and it spreads, trust me, players talk. Mm. And some like me, I wouldn't even think about the coach. I would just go do my job, be the best I can be, and not think about it. But if I have, if I'm surrounded by two or three players that are chirping about this and about that, next thing you know, well, yeah, I guess I don't like them either. Right. And so it spreads. And you start to ignore them, I'm sure, too, right? Like it just falls on deaf ears? Well, you do what you know, because if you feel like you're going to get benched, you're going to lose ice time. So you do have to pay attention to them. It's just, it's just not as much fun. When you worry about making mistakes versus thinking positive about scoring goals mm -hmm. and just re relaxing, then the game is not the same anymore. Now, when you watch the game these days versus, of course, you know, the the colorful past that you had, what do you what do you think of hockey these days? Like, do you think it has um, evolved in the manner that you think it, it should have or that you had expected it would be 20 years on? Or, or what's it missing? It's it's all about entertainment. Am I being entertained? I watched hockey back in the 60s, 70s, and I played in 70s, 80s, and 90s. Was that ent entertaining? Oh, darn right. <laughs> because of the, um, the rivalries, the hate, the characters of the game, the battles. Now, it was a little bit extreme. We were like gladiators on ice. It was a little extreme. They had to clean it up some. But when I watch games now, it, to me, it's boring. 
Like, you'll see some skill stuff, and it's nice. It's nice hockey. But I didn't grow up with that. Like, the millennials may like it because that's all they know. But what I saw back in the 80s and 90s, the battle, especially, like, in the playoffs. Like, we can go through a whole playoff series, two teams going after each other, playing for the Stanley Cup, and not one fight breaks out. Yeah, because you can put your team at a disadvantage then fighting in the playoffs. no, because normally it's two guys are going to get in the fight. Two guys are going to fight. They each get five minutes. So yeah, no, but how if they often? Got a concussion, or what if someone breaks their jaw and then they're out, right? Yeah, but I, I don't buy into that. <laughs> to me, is is I personally, unless players are really told by the coach, do not get in the fight, then they won't. But when you're competing that hard and you're caring, you're tired and you're frustrated and you're seeing a guy for in that same series, eventually you have a dislike. For me, it, it's it should be it's really part of it, and I don't. I, I'm not for fighting for no reason. I'm just, it's just, it's just part of it. When you're competing, you're going hard. Like a defenseman goes hard against a forward who's trying to score in front of the net. You're, you know, you're hitting each other. You're going to throw the elbow. Eventually, someone is going to say, you know what, I've had enough. And I still want to see that part of it without getting out of control. Right, because you don't want to get suspended. We see guys do something stupid out of emotion, and then, then they're out the entire playoffs. I, I would prefer two guys dropping the gloves, fighting versus a stick or a hit from behind right. to the head. A boarding call. That stuff I don't like. Part of it is because they've eliminated fighting. And they don't have the, the policemen. Like back then, if we boarded someone, oh, my God, I, I'd have five guys after me. And so we didn't do it because of the fear. We of, still do have those types of players, but they're being eliminated in the way that you have to show something else. Like you can't just be the guy that fights. You have to also be able to yes, in today's do game, something. Absolutely. Today's game, you have to be able to play. And so the, the game's opened up. They t- took out the red line, and so it was really open up. Now you got to really skate. If I was Gary Bettman, I would consider going back, and I probably would have done this uh, maybe 15 years ago when they were building these new facilities. It, everything was dated, bring new facilities. I would have gone with a wider ice surface, a little more mm-hmm. Olympic size, right. but I would have kept the red line because it's easy to just fire the puck up the ice. You don't. It doesn't take a lot of skill to do that, but... If you're a unit of five coming up the ice and making plays to get out of your zone, then you see more playmaking. Right. But now it's it's just too easy. Puck goes, fires up. Next thing you know, you're all the way at the other end. And it's just a lot of skating versus a little less playmaking. So I would have made this, the rink a little wider, keep the red line. That's what I would Other have than done. that, you, as commissioner, would you make any other changes? Um, well, they've eliminated a lot of the, those tough guys because they mm-hmm. wanted to make it more skill, which I understand. Uh, other than that, uh, I, I can't really think of anything else, no. Yeah, I mean, those, that's, those are very reasonable things to think of. And I would I want to talk to you a bit more about some of the, you mentioned fighting, and there's people that are for it, that are against it. Uh, you know, I understand the effects of some of these guys live with lots of issues afterwards that have had to be enforcers or they've had drug issues because of having to do these things every night. But I also see the side of it's entertainment, it's fun. I like that side of the game. Um, After the break, I want to find out your thoughts on whether you think fighting will be in the game forever. Mm, Okay. Next. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. We are drinking and binking, having a little Molson Triple X with Ron Duguay, former NHLer, Rangers legend, and a bit of a dancer, as we saw earlier. I'll never forget those dance moves, and I'm definitely putting it on Instagram. (laughs) Um, We were discussing fighting before the break and just its longevity within the sport. There are points on both sides. Where do you think the future of fighting is in hockey? I think it's it's right where it's at right now. I don't think it's going to change because you're going to still get guys that are going to get angry, will play with emotions. Uh, coaches encourage the emotion, the passion part of it. And uh, I don't think it'll ever leave unless the NHL says we want no more fighting. And I can't imagine them doing that because there's a certain, um, there are fans that um, watch the game for that entertainment side of it. And uh, I don't think it'll ever leave the game. Kind of has a WWE feel in a way, even though there are health repercussions for it. What would have to happen for fighting to end? Uh, wow, I, I just you'd have to you'd have to have a certain group complaining. Who's going to be that group that's going to complain enough? 
uh, unless the insurance companies, liability, sort of start talking about someone really gets hurt, yeah, I we're not going to cover died, you. Right? Uh, but even that, I don't even think they'd stop it. Yeah, I would. Yeah. So I, I think Gary Bet bad injuries. I think Gary Bettman understands that there's a certain element to fighting that uh, it really creates some sort of value to it as far as the entertainment value. You just mm -hmm. can't cut it out. Yeah, as a fan, it's definitely something I look forward to in a game when you see it. Maybe players don't necessarily feel the same way. It depends. Some of them, you know, also really like it as well. Well, part of it is is you want to be able to police yourself. So if there's a guy running around, he's a little bit of a bully. It's like the bully in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, the, uh, in the schoolyard. If, he, if it, no one uh, um, pays attention to him, gets in his face, he's just going to keep doing it. And guess what? He's going to end up hurting someone. And so right. then... I, I'm all for a guy from a team just say, hey, look, enough's enough. If you don't stop, then we're going to fight. Right. There's, then it kind of so controls kind of one itself. guy on each team, as you mentioned, or a couple yeah. guys. No, yeah. like, don't touch Sidney Crosby, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's right. The thing I didn't like is when it was a setup fight. The tough guy once said, hey, we need to fight because we're getting paid to do this. And it was set up and it was fake and it was, I don't like that. There were that. so many of those, yeah, too. Yeah, I don't like that whatsoever. Yeah, during warm-ups, guys would just circle around and be like, okay, yeah. second period, blah, blah, blah. It's a face-off circle. We'll do this. I read Bob Probert's book. And it was fascinating. Just, I yeah. mean. Yeah, so Bobby was my teammate. Right. And so I get I got to sit front row, and he was actually a, he was on my line a couple for a couple games, but I got to see front row, Probert, Kosher, Teddy Nolan, uh, Barry Melrose on that team. We had a tough team. You'd sit there, and it'd be like, wow, this is awesome. So how do you feel Bob was wired? Like what made him be able to do that role? Um, he just knew his role, and he he was he was so strong that uh, he didn't mind fighting, um, and he was he was really a nice guy. You know, off the ice, he was very quiet and gentle. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he just understood his rule. Him and Joey Kosher, before the game, they'd look at the lineup, say, "Okay, who do you want?" And he says, "Well, I'll get him, and you take him." And and it was it was a calculated thing because right. they knew on the other side either they're going to be challenged or those guys are going to be running around. But Proby was very comfortable doing it. Maybe not as much at the end because I wasn't around him at the end. But at the beginning, he, he enjoyed it. Right. Now, another guy who was really big into fighting is, of course, former uh, hockey coach and commentator Don Cherry from Hockey Night in Canada, who was fired last week. We talked about it with Sean Avery, and we've both given our thoughts publicly. But what, how do you feel about the whole situation? Um, a little strong. And uh, I, I saw the video and what he said and when he said, you people, it was like uh, it was almost um, he was discriminating. But if you go back to uh, a tape that he did, I think, I don't know if you've seen it, back in 98, talking about the poppy. Right. And he went, you people, meaning just you listeners. And so I know that's how he speaks. I know who he is. And he's, he, uh, he's different the way he speaks and the way he says things. So I, I thought it was a little bit strong. And um, uh, one man that I have a lot of respect for that I grew up as my role model is Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr came out and defended him. He says, I know this man. He's not a racist guy. He's a great guy. He's a very giving guy. He spoke from his heart more defending the soldiers, those that came before us. And uh, that was his main focus. And so I agree with Bobby Orr that it was a little extreme, that uh, there should have been a happy medium somewhere. Yeah. Firing him was a little too much. Is it possible to see that some of Cherry's comments you know, even a couple weeks ago and throughout the years have been offensive while also understanding that he has done so much for the game and he has been a tradition. Is it possible Absolutely. to be in a world where we can see yes. that he's both? See the big picture. Look at the big picture. People just point at one little thing and they just want to rip you because of that one But it's also thing. to be able to understand that maybe what he said necessarily wasn't the right words that he t should have used. That's that were offensive. That's what I'm saying. That he, right. I mean, as a female, he said things about female reporters in locker rooms that offended me. Mm -hmm. He's offended European guys, French guys. That he says, yeah. um, he said things over the years. So, like, I just feel as though you can understand where he come. Like, you can understand what he's done for the sport while also being like he yes. has offended people. Yeah. So you can, yeah. There's a, an argument on both sides. I I can agree. He's never offended me. And I, I just look at it to me as a little bit comical, the way he talks. And that's why he was the most popular male person on TV in Canada. Of all male people, he was the most popular. People want to tune in. And because he knows that, and they allow him to be that, so he's almost encouraged to be that guy. 
and sort so, of uh, in in a caricature, like yes. the loud suits and sort of yeah, so like I, you, outlandish comments. You see him off the air. He's quiet, and he's kind, and he's giving, and he's he's a nice guy. But he knows once he's he's on the air that they're almost encouraging him. Hey, Don, just be you, just be you. Then all of a sudden, now they chop his off <laughs> because but there he, is still uh, a responsibility that you yep. carry when you're on air, and in terms of being cognizant of everyone that you're talking to yeah. you have to be sensitive and you you can't say certain things in today's world yes yeah and just as a, it's but in everyday world like even if you were able to say it back then doesn't make it right yeah you know that's right and that's who he is and either you love him or you don't and uh but the bottom line but i think is you could love him while also seeing that what he said was not right do you know what i mean correct yeah like it's not it's not one case or the so, other so the question is was it a worthy of firing the man? That's the question. The I think that's line. a Sportsnet's um, question to answer. Yeah, and I so think they, probably sponsors factored into it, too. Yeah, yeah, and they're going to take a hit from it. I mean, they're willing to take a hit. It's going to be good and bad. It's going to be a mix, a little bit of both. The way that Don Cherry's career was going and the things that he was saying, it almost felt as though... He was never going to end off air unless something... Or he was never going to go off air unless something happened, right? Like Potentially. <laughs> like, it was just... He was going to be on air forever until yeah. he messed yeah. up, until it was one thing uh, too far. All right, we got to take a, a time out. Obviously, I feel passionate about it as well. Yes, so I appreciate I us that. being able to have this conversation. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about Ron's broadcasting career when we come back after this. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. We are making our way through some Molson Triple X with Ron Duguay, and we were just discussing Don Cherry. We've talked about fighting. And speaking of broadcasting, you're with MSG for 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. You haven't been with them since, like, what, what happened for a year? For year? Um, I don't know. I never got the answer. They, I was at the end of my contract, and they just didn't renew it. And that door closed on me and uh, it was funny because you know you hear a door close another one opens so this other opportunity came up right around the same time where I was asked to uh, go to schools in the Bronx and talk to kids and mentor to kids oh, great. so that's what I've been doing for the last year I go to schools I've gone over to uh, over 40 schools different schools and uh, I just talk, it's called Leadership and Legacy. So I talk to them about uh, leadership skills, mm -hmm. uh, really basic conversation. And I talk about legacy, what a legacy looks like. I kind of show them what my legacy looks like and what I'm still working on my legacy, which right. is, part of it is, is everything you do as far as your work and then who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I've been doing. Uh, very happy with it. And uh, recently I've been approached by the New York Post, Larry oh, Brooks. Great. And we're going to start our own Hockey Ranger podcast in December. I think December 5th will be our first show. Awesome. Yeah. So do you, did you have a previous relationship with Brooksy? Oh, or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. Sure. I was yeah. there when he started okay. with, with the Rangers. And, uh, you know, Larry could be, he's, I like his writing. He's, uh, for the most part, I will agree with him. But if you're a little bit off, he's gonna, you're going to read about it. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I, uh, but I respected him. And, uh, and I always, uh, I live in Florida. And every morning I go to the corner, I pick up the New York Post. Mm -hmm. And I love to read about the Rangers right. and Larry And Brooks. you were in it many years ago. So many you know in, well. yeah. So, you know, that page six to me has always kind of stuck with me. Of so course. I'm always curious to see what's going on in the city. Because I do still go out. I live in. Mm -hmm. I don't live in a city, but I'm out, and I still like to kind of be informed on who's who, what's what, that sort of thing. Um, and so, but Larry and I are going to talk together, talk Rangers, mainly talk hockey. We'll have some guests on, some mm -hmm. celebrity guests, those who go to the Garden, and I think it's going to be uh, an interesting show between what Larry sees and talks about, and what I see as as a you know former player, mm -hmm. and I have a passion for that jersey, in Madison Square Garden. Um, and I've coached, I played, and so I think it'll be insightful and fun, and um, I look forward to it. Yeah, and just getting back into broadcasting, because what's something, you know, when you look back on your MSG career, how would you describe it? Like, what's your biggest takeaway from it? I would sit there at times, especially early on for the four, uh, for at least four years, I'd be sitting at the desk, we would about to go on the air, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm the face of the Rangers. 
of all people that could be doing this, I am doing this. How grateful am I? I had to pinch myself. There were times where I'd say, wow. So there were certain nerves to it because of uh, there's uh, other, like what we're doing, we're just talking, mm -hmm. right? We're talking, we can talk, I can talk all day. But with doing a show, there's a technique, there's structure, there's timing. And uh, once you throw words out there, they don't come back. And so there's the nerves of being able to say what you want to say within, like they tell you, you got 45 seconds, you got a minute. So all that structure and, and making sure you represent yourself well, represent the team well, um, it takes a while. You, you right. know, people look at it and they think, oh, it's easy. It's not as easy as it looks. So it, it took me a good four or five years to really be comfortable in my skin and actually really feel um, comfortable with thinking, you know what, I belong here. Mm -hmm. I should be here because the response I would get from the fans, they liked me there. And of course, the way I dressed was different. I had the big 80s hair and, and uh, eventually I got rid of all that. I, I got out of the 80s. I'm now in, in today's world yeah. and more conservative. And so towards, I really liked it. Right. And uh, a lot of it had to do with, I, I probably became more popular a, a few years ago with doing television than I was as a player. Mm -hmm. I mean, I walked the streets and people recognized me, even the And you were very popular as a player, as we learned earlier on in the show. Yeah. But I have to ask you, you mentioned that, you know, your words go out there and you don't get them back. And we were talking in the commercial break and I'd be remiss not to bring it up. But the fact that when you you mentioned women's hockey in a derogatory manner, but as as a female who plays hockey, when you look back on that moment now, how do you think you could have handled it? Well, first better? of all, it was late at night. I was not drinking. <laughs> it was late at night, they're playing the Kings, and we go on the air about one in the morning. Well, one in the morning, you're tired, right? And it was a game where it was an important game for the Rangers to win. They end up losing, and I think the big reason they lost, the officiating had a bad night, and a lot of it had to do with how they were calling penalties. Things they should have called, they didn't call, and things they called, they shouldn't have called. And at the end, I said, you know, these officials were so bad tonight, they would have been better off officiating women's hockey where there's no hitting. It would have been more simple for them to make uh, do the right call. That's all I said, as I said it right now. I wasn't referring well, to. You said it kind of just like women's hockey, with no hitting. But you, but you. Meant I was to referring say, to the rules. Right. Don't get me started now. <laughs> hey, we talk about everything here on the show. Yeah, I was. I was referring to the penalties. Right. There's no penalties in women's hockey. But you rub people. There's no checking in women's hockey. There's no checking. Yeah, but they play hard. Yes, of course. Yeah. I know very well. I uh, played both women's and men's hockey. But now you received a lot of criticism from that. Can you understand why that might have rubbed people the wrong way? Because I didn't get a chance to explain myself. I should have gone back on the air next game or the game after that, and uh, MSG didn't allow me to do it to explain exactly what I meant. I didn't mean that I don't think the women's hockey or the women's play hard. They play hard, but there's no hitting there's a rule of no hitting. These officials were having a hard time making a call, hit, no hit. And that's, I was just really, it was directed to the officials, not women's hockey. What I should have said, I should have said youth hockey. Youth hockey, there's no hitting. I would have been better yes. off. But Take I think, gender I, you, out know of what? It. you know, here's the thing. I think I was using women's hockey to poke at the officials. But it, it flipped on me. I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, a lot of people kind of, oh, runs like a girl, throws like a girl, which are offensive to women. So um, throwaway well, comments, but okay, kind here, of like Don Cherry, you can't say those things okay, anymore. Okay, here's another thing. And I would have said, I said, just so you know, I have a strong connection to women's hockey. You know why? I coached, and I had two assistant coaches. Those two assistant coaches were coaches and have rookies. Guess who coached the Olympic team, the American Olympic team that won the gold medal? Cammy Granato? No, the the men's coaches. Oh right, okay. Who? Uh, it was um, uh, Brett Strout and um, and what's his name? Uh, um, oh my God, I'm blank on his name. They were my assistant coaches. They end up coaching women's hockey, and we'd be talking all the time. And I love watching women's hockey. The Olympians? I don't doubt that. Rob Stopper. I'm sorry, I could probably just. I lost his name. It's Rob Stopper because I don't want to. It's right. Rob Starr. They were both coaches. They coached for me. They end up coaching the women's hockey team. And uh, so I had a strong connection mm -hmm. to women's hockey. Right. I understand. And, and no one's saying that you wouldn't. I think in all these circumstances that we've discussed on TV, you got to choose your words probably a little yeah. bit more carefully. And I'm sure you'll learn that as you do the podcast. No, I'm not trying to grill you. Yes. But it, as I said, oh. I couldn't not have you on doing this. Okay. I have to go to break. But okay. we'll be back after okay. this. Okay. Right. <laughs> We're back.
guys. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. We've got Ron Duguay, who is a former Rangers legend, still current Rangers legend, former broadcaster, actually current broadcaster as well. As we mentioned, these Molson Triple X's are working well right now. And uh, have a couple quick questions for you. We've talked a lot of hockey and your um, personal life and different things like that, but just some things from your background and your childhood. Number one, three childhood idols. When you were a kid, who'd you idolize? Uh, that would be um, hockey players. I was such a hockey player, and that would be Bobby Orr, Phil Esposito, and Tony Esposito was a goaltender, but I loved the Esposito brothers, but more than anything else is Bobby Orr because of how he played the game. Yes, yeah. it was incredible. Uh, two tickets to any event in the world, what would it be? Um, event, well, I love music. I love the Eagles. I, was, uh, I, had, I had friendship with Glenn Fry. And so if I can go to, I have not seen the current uh, Eagles, so I would love, like, if I, someone gave me an opportunity to see the Eagles, like today, I would go see the Eagles. That's great. Okay. Um, speaking of singing, what's your favorite karaoke song? I, Sing. uh, it would probably, uh, My Blue Suede Shoes, Elvis Presley. Okay. Yeah. I That's remember. Go-to? Huh? That's your go-to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't do karaoke because of, I leave it You're to the singers. Out. Yeah, huh. you dance. I will dance. Yeah. I will dance mm -hmm. to karaoke. You'll break it down. Okay, what is the uh, biggest misconception about you? Um, that, I mean, I am a little bit of a free spirit. Um, sometimes I, I do get quiet, and some people kind of think of me as uh, they, from, in my quiet time, they think, well, he's just not talkative. You know, it's just maybe he's, he might be a little bit arrogant, right? And uh, so I uh, sometimes I get really quiet, and other times you see me as I am now. So maybe I don't, uh, they kind of see me in a different light. Right. I yeah. mean, hey, you can have different personalities for different moments in time. Yeah. Um, we got to take a quick break, but we'll be back after this. Hey guys, back on Drinks with Binks. We have to unfortunately say goodbye to Ron Duguay, who has been an absolute pleasure. We've been able to drink and also have very good conversations, which mm -hmm. is a testament to our own brains. So we know that you have a podcast coming up with the New York Post, and also you're still doing your work um, with children, and it's in the Bronx, right? Correct. Yes. yes. Okay, you are just everywhere these days, so we'll have to make sure to tune in. And where can we find you? Where can we follow you? Um, on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Ronduguay10. It's pretty simple. I, uh, you know, I like to show pictures here and there. I was at the garden last night, and so I make it fun. I keep it light. And, um, yeah, and I like to follow others, so I encourage people to follow me. Awesome. Okay, it's great to see that you're still at the garden. I'm sure that they love your presence. And the Blue Shirts have been doing pretty, pretty well. And you know who else is doing pretty well? me i'm drunk right now basically <laughs> i can say that because my mom's the only one watching so she'll call me afterwards and say julie what are you doing on tv yep. cheers have a great weekend everybody bottoms up